it's the Saturday, 13th of March, 2021. <clears throat> Abayagiri, winter retreat. Life of the Buddha. One thing that's apparent from the life of the Buddha is this, there's this sense in, in the practice of overcoming. So there's overcoming obstacles, overcoming defilements, and overcoming various uh, obscurations and hindrances. So there's this, this sense of overcoming. And there's also a sense of there's a interesting phrase where the Buddha speaks very matter of factly, but he says that was that which wasn't present before is now present. So that which which was those skillful qualities which weren't present before, they're now present. And unskillful qualities which were present before are now not present. So there's a sense of change and of evolution. And there's something to be said for just sticking with it. At times it'll be, the practice will be quite difficult. It's just this way for everybody. And reading the biography of Tanajan Dan, it was even difficult for him at times when he thought it would, he, he was cruising for a while and thought it was easy and then, then it would get difficult. Things he didn't foresee would come up. So that's, that's just how it is. <clears throat> but no matter how much we try to get away from it, dukkha is still there. Wherever we go, there we are. We might want to go to, say, Japan. Maybe it'll be better. Dukkha still still be with us. Although it can be good to change our situation around. Sometimes it can be good to change kutis. Sometimes it can be good to live indoors sometimes, live outdoors sometimes, depending on the situation. But if we're constantly looking for the perfect situation, we're never gonna find it. And the dukkha is always gonna be there. If there's a situation that's really bad, really not working, really untenable, yes, we have to change the situation, we have to get out of it. But if we're trying to optimize our situation and always try to fine tune it and find the perfect conditions for practice, that'll never really come about. So just because the dukkha, it'll never be perfect because of dukkha. Only when the dukkha is gone will it be perfect. And then it won't matter where we are. It's not perfect because of dukkha. It's not perfect because of tanha, because of craving. That's why it's not perfect. 
it's not perfect because we want it to be otherwise. We're not perfect because we want ourselves to be other. <laughs> Paradox, yet it's so simple. So to see dukkha, that's very important. If we can't see dukkha, then the only option is to run away. And we don't need to make ourselves have more dukkha so we don't need to torment ourselves or hurt ourselves somehow the, there's already enough dukkha there so whatever we do it's going to come up tormenting ourselves or being overly austere it'll just make us run away quicker So it's, and, and things get compli extra complicated. There's the sense of self, the sense of self comes up and then, uh, then it gets even harder. So the, the sense of self, the sense of identification and uh, Dukkha, it's all dukkha. So the life of the Buddha sort of illustrates this and the life of the great disciples illustrates this as well. And there's great bhikkhu and bhikkhuni disciples there's a one in the book, The Great Disciples of the Buddha. There's some minor great disciples that are, there's some short stories near the end of it. And there's a bhikkhuni who ordained later in life. And her name is Sona something or other. She's one of the Sonas. She's a bhikkhuni, but ordained later in life. And so... She had a lot of habits from her lay life that were very ingrained because she ordained later in life. And so the other bhikkhunis started getting irritated with her because she had all these strange habits from her lay life. And she would kind of be like, had strange eating habits and, and would kind of be difficult to point out things too difficult to teach. And so they were kind of irritated with her and <clears throat> they were kind of going to give up on her. But then she had this incredible determination, this incredible courage come up in her mind and, and it flipped over and she decided to keep the sitter's practice and then practiced very hard, very ardently and had this reflection come up that yeah, I have all these habits from my lay life and I ordain later in life. And so it's, I have to practice extra hard and I don't have, I have less time as well. So death could come at any time. So the death contemplation came up and then also the reflection that these habits are really difficult to go against. And so she started practicing day and night and 
broke through, broke through to stream entry and, and Arhantship, kept going till Arhantship, and became one of the Arhants. It gives this, I like that story because it gives this sense that anything is possible. She was this irritating elderly lady who ordained later in life and then reached Arhantship, flipped it around and overcame all the obstacles. So it gives that sense that anything is possible. So when we're really down and out and really stuck in the thick of it, and, then, uh, and we're getting our asses kicked uh, by dukkha, then we can remember to see it and, and flip it around. And we, it's not even really about the technique, but it's more the skillful means. Sometimes we'll have little insights. It might not happen when we're meditating. We might think we're terrible meditators because can't stop thinking about this and that. Can't stay with the meditation object. So we might think, well, we might as well give up. Been practicing for 18 years, can't stay with the meditation object. Might as well give up. But then it can flip around. We might be walking on a trail and suddenly an insight comes up or we see something in a way we didn't see before. Or we might be walking on the trail, mulling over some sort of story and then suddenly realize that we're outside in nature and it's really beautiful all around us. We start looking around, get out of our head. That's, that's insight as well, just to see that. So there's this, this insight that there's the defilements, there's greed, hatred, and delusion. And Bodhi can't coexist with those things. Awakening is the, through the non-greed, the non-anger, the non-delusion. So if there's something like, say, er anger or irritation in the mind, we might be getting really worked up about something or somebody. And then that reflection that this isn't, Bodhi doesn't exist with this state. The Bodhi heart, the Buddha heart, doesn't exist with this state. This is the antithesis of that. And that, can, that kind of insight, seeing that clearly can help to flip that around. And we can, we can wake up. We can wake up out of it. We can wake up out of anger. We can wake up out of greed. Wake up out of delusion. It's like when we wake up, what are, what are we waking up from? When, if we're going to wake up, then we're waking up from that greed, hatred, and delusion that we're in now. We want to wake up from that. So this, this is what's in the mind now. The story in the mind is a dream, and we want to wake up from that. So Buddha means awake. So that's the, the life of the Buddha is pointing, pointing that out to us. It's like before the Buddhahood, there's the bodhisattva. So the sata just means being. Bodhi is bodhi, awakening. So the being, seeking, awakening. We say in some of the chants, sabe, sata, suki, hontu, may all beings be happy. Sabe is all sata, beings.
so it's just this very, very straightforward, very simple. Some of the legends around the life of the Buddha are pretty great as well, even though they're commentarial. Yeah, some of them are really good. And if anybody ever wants to, anybody watching this live stream, if they want to make a movie out of the Buddha at some point, it'd probably be pretty good. <clears throat> you could make a Disney movie, a musical. You could make it a musical. And uh, there's, there's one... Because in, in Disney movies, you have the characters singing, and uh, there, there's a lot of songs interspersed in those movies. And I thought of this when, when I read about a certain legend. I was reading the Buddha's life story in Thai, and they have all the commentarial stories added in. And it's when the, it's relating how the prince Siddhartha first hears the word Nibbana and it, it stirs something deep inside him. And it's when he's up looking out a window, he's in kind of a pensive mood and there's a one of his or sorry, yeah, the the, uh, the prince is walking down the street and one of his relatives is looking out a window at him like his uh, one of the princesses or minor queens, you know, looking looking out the window and, and watching him walk down the street. And he's walking down the street quietly and she's singing. And uh, she's like, when, when people see Siddhartha, everybody becomes cool. And uh, the word cool, Nibbana. And when everybody sees Siddhartha, everybody feels cool. He hears this and he hears the word Nibbana and it sticks with him and he's walking up then he's walking down the street thinking, you know, Nibbana, Nibbana. Yeah. So that that's a nice story of that word getting into his mind. Yeah. He's contemplating it. Sometimes something helpful, not just thinking about the life of the Buddha, but something helpful in practice can also be thinking about past practice experiences. Or if we've been at this for a long time, we can think about just the fact that we've been doing this for a long time. How long have we been practicing? How long have we been keeping precepts? And we can also think of different meditation retreats we may have done, meditation experiences we may have had, experiences with different ajans that we may have had in the past. I can remember meet times of meeting up with Lumpur Sumedho, which were meaning, meaningful for me, and, uh, or Lumpur Ban, or different meeting up with different ajans, having different exchanges. So that can be helpful. And sometimes if we've been at this for a while, then, then the practice can change and shift in different ways too. And it, it really becomes different. And at first, it, a lot of the time it's about being happy. So in the, in the beginning, practice is about being happy. We want to be happy all the time. We want to have well-being, and we might be cultivating mindfulness in order to have more of a sense of well-being and confidence in our lives. So, and for a lot of people, this is the practice. We, we stop there. We might be content with that, like, okay, I just want to lead a better life, and be able to mindfully drink a cup of tea and, and be happy. But then later on, we start to question that. And what is happiness and unhappiness? What is the nature of happiness and unhappiness? And what is the nature of feeling? So 
we're, we're looking for pleasant sensation, pleasant feeling. But then we contemplate that and we think, well, that's what I've always been seeking. Even when I wasn't practicing, I was seeking pleasant sensations and trying to avoid unpleasant sensations and always been doing that. And then we realize that our whole practice has just been doing that on, but trying to do it in a different way. So then we gain some insight. We say, well, what's insight into feeling? What's the nature of feeling? What's the nature of pleasant feeling and unpleasant feeling? And we start to see them a little bit more as the same nature and we see it as just feeling arising. So it loses its importance, whether there's pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling, it loses its importance. And then we're just mindfulness of feeling. We're just, we just see that there's feeling and it's changing all the time. So the feeling is always changing. So we start to see that start to see that the feeling is always changing. And there's, there's different feelings that come up based on when we think about ourselves or we interact with other people and we, mi we might wanna be seen in a certain way or we might see ourselves in a certain way and those are associated with different types of feelings. But then when we call feeling into question, then it kind of loses its, its importance whether it's pleasant or unpleasant pleasant feeling is still nice and painful feeling is still not so nice, but we start to see them as anicca. So we start to see them as their true nature. They're always changing. So then the clinging starts to become less. We stop clinging to them. And then when we start to call feeling into question in this way and we start to see its true nature, there can be a sense of vulnerability that comes up. And this is also interesting too because there's a sense of vulnerability because we don't really know then, we're in uncharted territory, so we don't really know what's gonna happen next. And that can be a, a little bit scary when we start to be, see the true impermanence of feeling we start to see that pleasant feeling is just that much, unpleasant feeling is just that much. But because we were spending our whole lives up to this point trying to get more pleasant feeling and trying to get away from unpleasant feeling, then we can feel unmoored. We can feel like we don't have an anchor. And there might, well, what, what do I strive for now if I'm not striving for pleasant feeling and getting rid of unpleasant feeling? So then we watch that, we watch that and we start waking up to the true nature of feeling. So, so the waking up process can be leading to a sense of vulnerability and some fear can come up with that, that's normal. And that's when it's important not to stop practicing, not to feel like, oh, this is, this is strange, this is scary, this is, maybe something's not right. But rather, this is a good opportunity then to come back and look at dukkha. That's when there's gonna be the emptiness, when we start seeing the empty nature of pleasant and unf unpleasant feeling, then there's gonna be the emptiness there and deeper things from the mind are gonna come up and try to fill in that gap and so that's how we, that's like a purification. That's when that process of purification is happening. The empty mind is like a vacuum and then these thing, things keep coming up into it and it might seem embarrassing or strange or frightening. But at that point we just look at the dukkha and we start, to, then we start to see the empty nature of the mind and the things coming up in the mind. A lot of it might be quite convincing and compelling. Those thoughts of just, just run away, get away from this. 
So if we, if we can't see it as dukkha, then yes, the, what we'll do is we'll run away. That's if we aren't able to see the dukkha clearly and understand it, then we'll want to get away. Somehow we'll want to change our situation. We'll want to go somewhere else, be someone else. <laughs> I remember early on thinking, actually before I ordained, thinking if I was anyone other than who I am, then I would be happy. <laughs> anyone else, in the, if I was anyone else in the whole world than who I am now, then I would be happy. <laughs> I remember having that thought. just go somewhere else, be someone else. Yeah. Or if everyone else could just be more like me, then I would be happy. Wouldn't that be a nightmare if everyone was just the same as us? It's just <laughs> everyone, everyone's just clones. But in the end, greed, hatred, and delusion, it's, they're all very strange. Why, why anger? Why greed? Why craving? If we really look at it, it doesn't make sense. Why suffering? Suffering doesn't make sense. And it's not fair. Why suffering? But it all comes back to we just keep creating the causes for suffering. We want Nibbana, but we keep creating the causes of, for suffering in our search for it. So we want, in our search for happiness, in our search for pleasant sensation, we misunderstand. So suffering was all just a big misunderstanding. Any atrocities in the world, any huge genocides and horrific mass deaths of populations, it's all just a big it was all just from a big, unfortunate misunderstanding, misapprehension of what was actually going to be of benefit. It seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, kill 70 million people, make everybody the same. <laughs> it seemed like, and then I'll be happy. <laughs> but <laughs> that, that's what the mind is doing. It doesn't work doesn't work that way. So we have to actually, that's why the Buddha is so amazing. He discovered this path of wisdom and seeing clearly. The Buddha is wonderful and marvelous, but uh, he saw these things so clearly. And kind of mysterious too, how did, how did it actually get discovered? That's the parami that's what we call the paramita, the perfections. Over countless lifetimes, the Buddha cultivating these perfections. So when we think about the life of the Buddha, it's not just this his last life, but it's the whole cultivation of the paramis, the spiritual perfections, to allow, allow him to see clearly so that's all of us too. We all have our paramis wherever we're at, our spiritual maturations. So every, everybody's at a different place on this path, but all of us here, to a greater or lesser extent, we at least have that intuitive sense that there might be a way out of dukkha. So as we practice for a long time, we might also have this experience 
it might only happen once or twice, but it's enough to keep us going for years, even if it only happens once or twice, this feeling or a intuition that it might be possible for us to get out of dukkha if we keep practicing. Or it might just be possible might just be a way, this Noble Eightfold Path, there might just be something to it. Uh, we might just be able to come to an end of the long road of suffering. Uh, Mei-Chi Gao, in her biography, she talks, ab talks about that. It's like, when you see clearly that the end of the long road of dukkha is coming into view, there's just so much inspiration, so much enthusiasm for the practice. And, and it, it has been a long road. Even if we think just in terms of this life, we don't even have to think in terms of many lives. We think just in terms of this life, it's, it's a long road. We think of those teachings of the Buddha where the tears we've shed in all of our past lives more than the ocean. If you just think of how many tears it would take to fill up a gallon jug of that, even that would be hard to do. Even if you cry all the time that would, and gathered all your tears, that would, that would be hard to do to fill up a five gallon jug of tears. So, and all the, all the bones from all of our past lives, more than the whole earth. So it's just incomprehensible, the, the suffering. So not, we don't want to think of it necessarily in physical terms, but think of it in terms of suffering, just how much suffering that's been. So we can ask ourselves, what are these teachings for? These teachings are for getting us to question how much is enough? How many more tears? You know, how many more bones do we do we want to shed? You know, how much how much suffering is enough? You know. Then the Buddha talks about the Sotapanna. He talks about the amount of dukkha for an ordinary person compared to the amount of dukkha. For a sotapanna is like the ordinary person, the dukkha would be like the whole earth. For the sotapanna, it'd be like the speck of dirt on a fingernail. But that that description is not necessarily a, like a present moment quantification. The experience is going to be pretty similar, but the Buddha is talking in terms of time. So for an ordinary person, they've got a whole world of dukkha to continue to look forward to. For a sotapanna, what's left in terms of future suffering is like the dirt on the fingernail. So it's almost nothing compared to just suffering on and on and on. So the experience would be, the present moment experience would be similar, but the, the future dukkha is, is much, much less can't even be, it's in, in, incomparable. So seeing dukkha is, is just really, really important. And then tanha, seeing that there's tanha, you know, there's the craving which, which really keeps us into it, in it. It's not perfect because we have tanha the situation is not perfect because we want it to be otherwise. That's what's making it not perfect. We're not perfect because we want ourselves to be otherwise. That's what is making us not perfect. These teachings of Lumpur Sumedho, like trying to perfect the personality, get the perfect personality, you know, but with Dhamma, we have to see completely through the personality. That's why it's so hard to know if we want to know like who has Dhamma, who's realized. We want to know who is at what level. 
you know, which Ajahns have attainments. It's really hard to see because you have to look completely beyond the personality. You're not going to look, you're not going to see it in the personality. There might be certain attributes like a sense of non-agitation or you have to look at not suffering. Is somebody suffering or not? But very hard to see. The Buddha called it the very hard to see. So we just know for ourselves. We have to keep practicing for ourselves, know for ourselves. <coughs> also, also good to have that, that goodwill for ourselves, you know, not get too much in that. Even though we can have compassion for our own suffering, that's possible as well. If it gets too much, we'll, all of us will have a threshold. Everybody will have it at a different level. So if, if the dukkha goes beyond the threshold, we're not going to be able to help but run away. So then it's good, at that point, it's good to have compassion for ourselves and ease up go for a walk, look around, look at the sky, get into bird watching, um, just get out of the mind, get out of the head somehow. Certainly don't watch you know, the computer or the phone, that, that's not gonna help. That's just gonna make it worse. Uh, that's, not, that's not gonna get us out of our heads, that's gonna get us more into our heads. That's pretty much, yeah, that's, but we want to get outside, um, feel something real, put our head in a stream, you know, uh, sit under a tree, touch a tree, get sap on your hands, see what that feels like. <laughs> that's, that's real, that, that's, that's what, that's what our forest is for. We have this big forest to practice in. Yeah. Drink some Doug fur tea. Talk to Tanjino. Yeah. Has more vitamin C than an orange. So we just, we just learn in this very natural way. And when the dukkha becomes too much, when the dukkha goes beyond our, thre our dukkha threshold, then we can try to get out of ourselves, try something different, shake things up a bit so that we don't completely you know, throw in the towel, give up. Go sand a piece of wood, contemplate the mind, you know, how it gets smoother and smoother and then reveals more and more of the texture, more and more of the beauty of it. That can be like a way to teach ourselves how to contemplate the mind. I found that's a great way to teach kids is just sanding wood with finer and finer sandpaper. And we're teaching Harlan and Lucy sanding, sanding the madrone wood and uh, how to use the sandpaper. And then when you've got the scratches from the previous coarseness of grit sandpaper, then you go to the finer one. And then they were competing who could get it the smoothest. You know, and, uh, but, but it got them really focused. It's a good, great way to get children focused is that interest in seeing it, the visible result of, of the wood and the beauty of the wood coming out with each successive like fineness, refinement of the sandpaper. So it can be like that as well as the purification of the mind. So these are just a few thoughts. Dukkha, Tanha, Life of the Buddha. Just leave it there for this evening.
Chant the verses of sharing and aspiration in Pali, volume 1, page 32. 